Hello and welcome to another episode of Unworthy History. Today we got some more actual history for you from this book right here, Indian Depredations in Texas by J.W. Wellbarger, published all the way back in 1889. Now today's story is episode two in my series on the Parker family and the massacre that took place at the Parker Fort back in 1836. This episode will pick up on that by focusing on those who are able to escape with their lives from that attack. When the attack on the fort first commenced, Mrs. Sarah Nixon made her escape, and she hastened to the field to advise her father, husband, and plumber of what had occurred. On her arrival, Plummer hurried off on horseback to inform Falconberry, Lunn, Bates, and Anglin, who were at work in their fields. Parker and Nixon started to the fort, but Parker met his family on the way and carried them some five miles down the Navasota River, secreting them in the bottom. Nixon, though unarmed, continued on towards the fort and met Mrs. Lucy, wife of Silas Parker, who had been killed, with her four children, just as they were intercepted by a small party of mounted and foot Indians. They compelled the mother to lift her daughter, Cynthia Ann, and her little son, John, behind two of the mounted warriors. The foot Indians then took Mrs. Parker, her two youngest children, and Nixon towards the fort. As they were about to kill Nixon, David Falconberry appeared with his rifle and caused them to fall back. Nixon, after his narrow escape from death, seemed very much excited and immediately left in search of his wife, soon falling in with Dwight and his own and Frost's family. Dwight and party soon overtook J.W. Parker and went with him to the hiding place in the bottom. Falconberry, thus left with Mrs. Parker and her two children, bade her to follow him. With the infant in her arms and leading the other child, she obeyed. Seeing them leave the fort, the Indians made several attempts to intercept them, but were held in check by the brave man's rifle. Several mounted warriors armed with bows and arrows, strung and drawn, and with terrific yells would charge them. But as Falconberry would present his gun, they would halt, throw up their shields, ride about, wheel, and retire to a safe distance. This continued for some distance until they had passed through a prairie of some 40 or 50 acres. Just as they were entering the woods, the Indians made a furious charge, when one warrior, more daring than the others, dashed up so near that Mrs. Parker's faithful dog seized his horse by the nose, whereupon both horse and rider somersaulted, alighting on their backs in the ravine. At this moment, Silas Bates, Abram Anglin, and Evan Falconberry, armed, and Plummer, unarmed, came up, causing the Indians to retire, after which the party made their way unmolested. As they were passing through the field where the three men had been at work in the morning, Plummer, as if aroused from a dream, demanded to know what had become of his wife and child. Armed only with a butcher knife, he left the party in search of his loved ones, and was seen no more for six days. The Falconberries, Lunn, and Mrs. Parker secreted themselves in a small creek bottom, some distance from the first party, each unconscious of the other's whereabouts. At twilight, Abraham Anglin and Evan Falconberry started back to the fort to succor the wounded and those who might have escaped. On their way, and just as they were passing Falconberry's cabin, Anglin saw his first and only ghost. He says it was dressed in white, with long white hair streaming down its back. I admit that I was more scared at this moment than when the Indians were yelling and charging upon us. Seeing me hesitate, my ghost now beckoned me to come on. Approaching the object, it proved to be old Granny Parker, whom the Indians had wounded and stripped with the exception of her undergarments. She had made her way to the house from the fort by crawling the entire distance. I took her some bed clothing and carrying her some rods from the house, made her a bed, covered her up, and left her until we should return from the fort. On arriving at the fort, we could not see a single individual alive or hear human sound, but the dogs were barking, the cattle lowing, the horses neighing, and the hogs squealing making a hideous and strange medley of sounds. Mrs. Parker had told me where she had left some silver, $106.50. This I found under a hickory bush by moonlight. Finding no one at the fort, 
we returned to where I had hid Granny Parker. On taking her up behind me, we made our way back to our hiding place in the bottom, where we found Nixon, whom we had not seen since his cowardly flight at the time he was rescued by Falconberry from the Indians. In the book published by James W. Parker on pages 10 and 11, he states that Nixon liberated Mrs. Parker from the Indians and rescued old Granny Parker. Mr. Anglin, in his account, contradicts, or rather corrects, this statement. He says, I positively assert that this is a mistake, and I am willing to be qualified to the statement I here make, and can prove the same by Silas H. Bates, now living near Grosbeck. The next morning, Bates, Anglin, and Evan Falconberry went back to the fort to get provisions and horses, and look after the dead. On reaching the fort, they found five or six horses, a few saddles, and some meat, bacon, and honey. Fearing an attack from the Indians who might still be lurking around, they left without burying the dead. Returning to their comrades in the bottom, they all concealed themselves until they set out for Fort Houston. Fort Houston, an asylum on this, as on many other occasions, stood on what has been for many years the farm of a wise statesman, a chivalrous soldier, and a true patriot, John H. Reagan, two miles south of Palestine, Texas. An account of this wearisome and perilous journey through the wilderness, given substantially in Parker's own words, will enable the reader to realize more fully the hardships they had to undergo and the dangers they encountered. The bulk of the party were composed of women and children, principally the latter, and ranging from one to twelve years old. We started from the fort, said Mr. Parker, the party consisting of 18 in all, for Fort Houston, a distance of 90 miles by the route that we had to travel. The feelings of the party can better be imagined than described. We were truly a forlorn set, many of us barefooted and bareheaded, a relentless foe on the one hand, and on the other, a trackless and uninhabited wilderness infested with reptiles and wild beasts entirely destitute of food and no means of procuring it. Add to this the agonizing grief of the party over the death and capture of their relatives, that we were momentarily in expectation of meeting the like fate, and some idea may be formed of our pitiable condition. Utter despair almost took possession of us, for the chance of escaping seemed almost an impossibility under the circumstances. I took one of my children on my shoulder and led another. The grown persons followed my example, and we began our journey through the thickly tangled briars and underbrush in the direction of Fort Houston. My wife was in bad health. Mrs. Frost was in deep distress for the loss of her husband and son, and all being barefooted except my wife and Mrs. Frost, our progress was very slow. Many of the children had nothing on them but their shirts, and their sufferings from the briars tearing their little legs and feet was almost beyond human endurance. We traveled until about three o'clock in the morning, when the women and children being worn out with hunger and fatigue, we laid down on the grass and slept until the dawn of day, when we resumed our perilous journey. Here we left the river bottom in order to avoid the briars and underbrush, but from the tracks of the Indians on the high lands, it was evident they were hunting us, and like the fox in the fable, we concluded it best to take the river bottom again, for though the brambles might tear our flesh, they might at the same time save our lives by hiding us from the cruel Indians who were in pursuit of us. The briars did in fact tear the legs and feet of the children until they could have been tracked by the blood that flowed from their wounds. It was the night of the second day after leaving the fort that all, and especially the women who were nursing infants, began to suffer intensely from hunger. We were then immediately on the bank of the river, and through the mercy of Providence a polecat came near us. I immediately pursued and caught it just as it jumped into the river. The only way that I could kill it was by holding it under water until it drowned. Fortunately, we had the means for striking a fire, and we soon had it cooked and equally divided among the party, the share of each being small indeed. This was all we had to eat until the fourth day, when we were lucky enough to capture another skunk and two small terrapins, which were also cooked and divided between us. 
On the evening of the fifth day, I found that the women and children were so exhausted from fatigue and hunger that it would be impossible for them to travel much further. After holding a consultation, it was agreed that I should hurry on to Fort Houston for aid, leaving Mr. Dwight in charge of the women and children. Accordingly, the next morning I started for the fort, about 35 miles distant, which I reached early in the afternoon. I have often looked back and wondered how it was I was able to accomplish this extraordinary feat. I had not eaten a mouthful of food for six days, having always given my share of the animals mentioned to the children, and yet I walked 35 miles in about eight hours. But the thought of the unfortunate sufferers I had left behind, dependent on my efforts, gave me strength and perseverance that can be realized only by those who have been placed in similar situations." God in his bountiful mercy upheld me in this trying hour and enabled me to perform my task. The first person I met was Captain Carter of the Fort Houston settlement who received me kindly and promptly offered me all the aid in his power. He soon had five horses saddled and he and Mr. Jeremiah Courtney went with me to meet our little band of fugitives. We met them just at dark, and placing the women and children on the horses, we reached Captain Carter's about midnight. There we received all the kind attention and relief that our condition required, and all was done for our comfort that sympathetic and benevolent hearts could do. We arrived at Captain Carter's on the 25th of May. The following day, my son-in-law, Mr. Plummer, reached there also. He had given us up for lost and started for the same settlement that we had. In due time, the members of the party located temporarily as best suited their respective families, most of them returning to Fort Parker soon afterwards. A burial party of 12 men from Fort Houston went up and buried the dead. Their remains now repose near the site of old Fort Parker. Peace to their ashes. Unadorned are their graves. Not even a slab of marble nor a memento of any kind has been erected to tell the traveler where rest the remains of this brave little band of pioneer heroes who wrestled with the Indian for the mastery of this broad domain. So that's the end of this story. This is episode two here in this ten-part series on Cynthia Parker and her life. So this covered the events of those who were able to escape from the Fort Parker Massacre back in 1836. It took them about six or seven days to get to Fort Houston where they were safe. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.